You see this little fiber I'm holding? That's right, you don't. I know you can't see it, and some of you were saying you would, but I know you can't because this little fiber's diameter is actually smaller than the visual resolution of the human eye. This fiber is literally invisible. In fact, it's so small you could put 1,600 of these into a single human hair. That's smaller than a bacterium. Just one kilogram of this fiber would stretch all the way from here to New York City, and then to Los Angeles, <laughs> and Tokyo, and Paris, and from Paris all the way around the world and back to Paris again. And from there <laughs> to the moon, seriously, where you'd still have enough left over to floss your teeth. Now, to be sure, the demand for dental floss on the moon is vanishingly small, but that little fiber is the result of a revolutionary breakthrough in technology that opens a whole new world of possibilities for fibers and fabrics of the future. These fibers I'm talking about are synthetic fibers made from plastic polymers like nylon and polyester, and they're the type of fibers you'd probably find in your clothing or other traditional textiles. And until recently, Traditional textiles were about as far as you could go with fibers, and until recently, fibers all looked pretty much like this. You could have one made of nylon or one made of polyester, but not both at the same time. But this new technology now allows us to make bicomponent fibers. That means that there are two polymers in each fiber, and it allows us to draw a picture in the cross section to determine where the polymers go in that fiber. The cross section is what you see at the end of the fiber when you cut it, like when you cut down a tree and you see the growth rings in the cross section of the trunk. In a fiber, though, whatever feature you see in the cross section runs the entire length of the fiber, so you get the same cross section no matter where you cut it. So, for instance, with two polymers now, we can make fibers with a cross section that looks like this, or maybe one like this or even like this. Within limits, if you can draw it, we can put it in the cross section of a fiber with a diameter of only about 15 microns. So let's say that you wanted to make that invisible fiber I showed you earlier. First, why would you want to? Probably not as a way to get to the moon, right? But it turns out on Earth, Tiny little fibers like that are exactly what you need to make an air filter that can capture the tiny particles that are the primary health concern in air pollution. So imagine, with a fiber so small that it's invisible, we could bring blue skies back to Beijing and lots of other places that need it too. So now you know why. Let me tell you how. With a very small fiber, the first problem you run into is that because it's small, it doesn't have enough strength to make it through the fiber-making process. And also because it's small, you can't make very much in an hour or a day. So even if you could make it, it'd be extraordinarily expensive. But with bicomponent fibers, you can do things with fibers that used to be impossible. So let's make that fiber with the cross-section that looks like the pepperoni pizza. This pizza fiber can be made at a standard size, so it has all the strength that you need to get through the process. And because it's relatively large, you can make quite a lot in an hour or a day, so the price doesn't have to be astronomical. The pepperonis on this pizza can be made from nylon or polyester or polypropylene, just about anything you want. But for the cheese on this pizza, we'll use a very special polymer that dissolves in water. So, we make a fabric from this fiber, and then all we have to do is run that fabric through a water bath. And the water dissolves out that water-soluble polymer, and what's left behind is a fabric made entirely of ultra-microfibers. Pretty cool, huh? Now let me show you the technology that makes this possible. You may remember from your childhood, there was a toy called the Play-Doh Spaghetti Maker. Right? <laughs> Some of you do? Yeah. 
Well, making fibers is actually pretty similar, except we use melted plastic instead of Play-Doh. You simply melt the plastic polymers and push them through a slab of metal with holes drilled in it. The, the streams that emerge are then cooled back to a solid, and the result is synthetic fibers. Of course, it's a lot more complex than that, but that's the basic concept. So if you want to make a bicomponent fiber like this one, though, you can't just melt two polymers and push them through the holes. You'd get a mess that way. Instead, we need dedicated flow channels to deliver the first polymer to the center of every single hole individually. And then we need more flow channels to deliver the second polymer to multiple positions around that first one, again, to every single hole individually. Now, you can cut grooves in the surface of the metal to form these flow channels, but in an industrial setting, you'd need more than 10,000 grooves per square, square foot of metal. And that's just for this simple cross-section. For the pepperoni pizza, you'd need more like half a million. So those grooves, of course, would have to be microscopic to accommodate all that. And that means that the machining bits you'd need to cut all those grooves would have to be impossibly small. And machining half a million flow channels, it would take years and cost a fortune. The breakthrough was invented by a guy named Bill Hills. He used a space program technology called photolithographic etching. Now, in this process, we start with a very thin sheet of metal, and it's on the surface of this metal where we'll form the grooves that we need. The first step is to coat this metal with a protective coating. Now, this coating is photosensitive, which means that it goes on as a liquid and can be solidified when it's exposed to light. So because of that, of course, this step is carried out in the dark. Now, the next step is to cover this with a transparent film that's been printed with the pattern we want for the flow channels. Now we can turn the lights back on, and of course, the light will shine through the transparent parts of the film, and underneath those areas, the coating is solidified. But underneath the printed areas, the light doesn't reach the coating, and so it remains liquid. And now we simply rinse away the liquid part of the coating, and that leaves bare metal exposed in exactly the pattern we want for the flow channels. And the last step is to dip the metal into an acid bath. And the acid etches away the metal, and what comes out is the, uh, the formed flow channels that we need. This next image is show some actual flow channels that were made using this process. And you can tell these were taken through microscope lenses uh, because they're so small. In fact, the size of these channels is limited only by the resolution of your laser printer. And what's really great is that the cost and time to make a million flow channels this way is exactly the same as the cost and time to make just one. The real revolution is this. If you have an idea for a new bicomponent fiber and you'd like to try it out, but it's going to take a lot of time and money to do that, chances are you'll never get the opportunity. But now, the, the barriers of cost and time have been brought so low, we can try any harebrained scheme that anybody comes up with. And the more solutions we try, the more problems we can solve. Like this one. This was the result of a collaboration with a fellow named Stephen Nightingale. Like I said, we can draw just about any picture we want in the cross section of the fiber, which means that we can selectively turn these dots on or off. And with enough dots, you can form millions of unique, uh, distinct dot patterns in the cross section of the fiber. That makes the cross section a two-dimensional barcode that can be read by a scanner that's really just a microscopic version of the scanner you use at the grocery store. Beep. The Pac-Man in the center tells the scanner where 12 o'clock is. So the dot patterns aren't ambiguous. And then regardless of which dot pattern we choose, that same dot pattern runs through the entire length of the fiber. So if we slice the fiber into 10 micron disks, the result is a very fine micro powder with that same unique identifying dot pattern on every single particle. Now those particles can be adhered to the surface of just about any product. And so now the scanner can cross-reference that product 
with all kinds of information, things like where it was made, who made it, when it was made, where it's been, between the factory and the store, what components or ingredients it contains, anything you might want to know. So we'll toss a few of these particles into fertilizer. And the next time a terrorist detonates a fuel oil and fertilizer bomb, the police will track that fertilizer to the exact time and place it was sold. Or it turns out you can make these fiber particles out of edible materials. So put them on pharmaceutical tablets and now we can fight drug counterfeiting and we can help the pharmacist avoid dispensing errors. Here's another idea. This one was invented by Dr. Veronica Kapsali and myself. In this fiber we have nylon on the outside and polypropylene on the inside. Now polypropylene doesn't react to water at all, but nylon will. Nylon will actually absorb moisture even just from the atmosphere. And when it does, the nylon swells. So when this fiber encounters a humid environment, the nylon swells, but the polypropylene doesn't. And that causes the fiber to spontaneously curl. So if you make a yarn from these fibers, you can make a shirt from the yarns. And the yarns I'm talking about are not the thick, fuzzy yarns your grandma used to knit afghans. In this context, a yarn is the very thin threads that are used to knit or weave fabrics for, for garments. So if you're wearing a shirt made from these fibers and you begin to sweat, and it occurs to me right now I'd really like to have one of those shirts. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're wearing the shirt and it, and you start to sweat, the um, fibers start to curl up and that causes them to wrap themselves more tightly into the yarn. That means the diameter of the yarn decreases. So if the yarns get smaller, that means that the pores between the yarns get bigger. That opens up the fabric and makes it more breathable so that the moisture vapor can escape and keep you more comfortable. Now, when you stop your workout and things start to dry out, the fibers go back to their original shape and now the fabric closes back up and becomes an insulator so that you don't catch a chill. And this process is infinitely repeatable. So these are just a few examples of some of the really remarkable things that fibers can do now. But I hope that it at least gives you a sense for how broad the horizon is for fibers in the future because the future is where you come in. Do you remember when the iPhone first came out? You know, that first model only had about 15 apps on it. But when people discovered what the phone would do, all over the world they started coming up with ideas for apps that I bet Apple never dreamed of. And today, some of those apps are already important parts of the way the world works. Similarly, now you know how tiny fibers are solving big problems. Things like cleaning our air and water, purifying our food, improving fuel efficiency for our cars, fighting counterfeiting and terrorism, solving problems that may have nothing at all to do with traditional textiles, and solving them for people who never thought that fibers would be the right solution. So my question for you is this. What problem are you facing that I've never tried to solve with a fiber? Yet, anyway. Because yesterday, Fibers were old school technology. They were plain and simple and easily overlooked. But today, bicomponent fibers are being made to change the world. And tomorrow, tomorrow, a tiny little fiber may be just what you need for whatever comes your way.